just do this. Sean um, is one of the um, Navy residents that's with us right now, and we're grateful to have you uh, hanging out with us, Sean, and look forward to hearing you talk to us about mental invasive surgery for trauma. Awesome. Yeah. Can everybody hear me? Yes, sir. Can. Awesome. I think we'll get a little bit of feedback here. I'm going to turn the volume down. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, good morning. My name is Sean Shepard. I'm one of the PGY4s over at Balboa, one of the Navy residents. So thanks for having me. And um, it's been a good rotation thus far. Um, this morning, I'll be talking about minimally invasive surgery for trauma, really mainly in the thoracolumbar um, area, as most literature is regarding um, that specific region. So um, just a little outline. So I'll go through an intro, epidemiology, some classification, um, indications for surgery, uh, just kind of brush uh, on techniques and then conclusion. So a bit of introduction, uh, minimally invasive spine surgery or MISS, um, as I'll refer to it, uh, originally developed for treatment of degenerative lumbar conditions, but it has broadened its applications as, um, you know, uh, better technology has come out and the need for um, minimally, minimally invasive surgery uh, really for the, uh, the trauma application to kind of decrease the morbidity. So the techniques are based on the preservation of soft tissue while maintaining principles of spine decompression, stabilization, and deformity correction. Um, the techniques are, they're valuable tools in the context of damage control, which is a big thing, a big push been going on in the last 10 to 15 years to really decrease morbidity um, in the polytraumatized patients, just because um, there's a lot of literature about first hit and second hit. So the, the least amount of damage that one can do uh, or, you know, morbidity one can do when trying to stabilize fractures or, uh, you know, fracture dislocations, then one can uh, can help the patient in the long run. Uh, and then, like I said, main applications. There are applications throughout the entire spine, um, but probably the, the most talked about is in the thoracolumbar uh, region. <clears throat> so uh, a bit of epidemiology. Uh, estimated 160,000 spine fractures per year in the U.S., and more than half of those are in the thoracolumbar spine. There is, as, as everything in um, fracture care, bimodal distribution. So young, high energy, and old, low energy. Um, about a quarter of these uh, thoracolumbar fractures do involve the spinal cord. Um, and then as, as we know in, in polytraumatized patients, there are uh, usually other, especially the high energy stuff, there's usually other injuries involved. You know, 11% of non-contiguous C-spine trauma, 19 in the extremity, 13 in head, uh, also have head trauma, and then a 10% rate of abdominal trauma. So all of this is kind of to, to take into account the, the rest of the body and the rest of the patient when kind of considering uh, surgical fixation or management and timing. Um, and in the thoracolumbar region, that, the, the most common is usually wedge and burst fractures. Um, so kind of getting into classification systems, when we're talking about MIS, it's really no different than normal trauma. Um, you need to, one, diagnose the, the problem and then kind of figure out what to do. So um, classically, the TLIX um, is a classification system used, and it's no different in MIS, I, I would say. I'll kind of touch on this later on, but there's no you know, hard indication for MIS. It's really just surgery or no surgery. And then it's based on the surgical preference, uh, how one's, one wants to go about uh, fixing this. So um, as everyone knows, the TLIC system is based on the fracture morphology, neurologic status, and the integrity of the ligament and structures. Um, you know, four or less is usually um, non-surgery, and then, you know, five or more, uh, sorry, less than four non-surgery, five or more um, is usually operative, and then four is kind of that gray zone where it, when and a lot of stuff does, you know, fall into four, so it's kind of deciding what to do at that point. So um, this is a good system in decision-making process because it, it does kind of push you towards a treatment algorithm or a treatment plan. More recently, AO has come out with a um, kind of multifactorial um, classification system. This is relatively new. Um, it is kind of getting getting out there and um, it's, got, it's good in the fact that it's really uh, useful for um, diagnosis. They're still trying to figure out and, you know, kind of looking into the AO website and um, they're still trying to really corroborate this and, and develop good treatment algorithms based on this classification system. And correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I think TLIX is 
um, still very widely used for therapeutic decision making, but the AO uh, system is good for diagnosis. <clears throat> there was a, a meta-analysis back in 2018 showing that TLIX is still more widely used and preferred for, um, for therapy decision making, but the AO actually has better inner observer uh, reliability in, in, in making a diagnosis. So these are just kind of some, some newer uh, systems. So a bit of rationale um, for MIS in particular, it does, um, uh, dam well, in orthopedics, at least we talked about damage control. Damage control orthopedics uh, in the trauma situation is something that um, allows us to kind of get in, get out quickly. Uh, and the minimally invasive spine surgery is, is really not that different. It's kind of uh, designed to reduce the physiologic burden and morbidity associated with traditional open approaches in these unstable and polytraumatized patients. Um, there's an interesting article in 2006, this risk factors, respiratory failure. This was at JBJS. It was a retrospective study of over a thousand uh, patients at a level one trauma center. And it was looking at um, risk factors for respiratory failure in spine trauma patients. Um, one thing they did find was early surgical stabilization of spine fractures was the only physician dependent risk factor that was associated with lowering the rate of respiratory failure in these patients. So. Um, uh, very big as far as from a physician standpoint, because there is things that we can do, uh, there are things we can do to um, help prevent uh, later uh, complications. Um, for the rationale, so kind of there's continual advancements in the MS field uh, of the last decade to include, um, can I improve per percutaneous pedicle fixation, there's powerful reduction tools, um, newer maneuvers to be able to pass the rod once the, the uh, pedicle screws are in place, um, and then just newer techniques, especially in the, in the fusion aspect. So <clears throat> many injuries can be addressed posteriorly, and, and I would say posterior techniques are probably been around certainly the longest. Um, there are new, newer techniques coming out. Um, and so back in 2005, uh, Kim et al. looked at uh, a couple of different techniques. They actually looked at uh, MRI before and after on patients that were uh, fixed with uh, pedicle fixation in both the open and the percutaneous approaches. And they were looking at uh, specifically atrophy of the multifidus um, musculature. And they did find a, a, on cross-sectional MRI, there was a significant decrease in the kind of the bulk of the multifidus muscle. They didn't actually find any... Uh, you know, significant clinical differences in um, extension muscle strength or patient-related uh, outcomes in this specific study. But, you know, as I'll talk about uh, later, there are newer studies that have showed some uh, patient-specific difference in outcomes. So these top pictures are um, of the percutaneous pedicle fixation in the bottom are the, are the open, and specifically the multifidi are the ones that they were looking at for cross-sectional uh, decrease. Um, so more kind of rationale. So the uh, this is a specific paper, kind of noting difference in um, blood loss, a shorter operative time, shorter length of stay after the procedure, and percutaneous uh, fixation approaches over uh, traditional open approaches. Um, and, and this specific study showed that there was a, a benefit for lowering post-operative pain and improving functional recovery within that, within the three months of surgery. There's really no difference past the three month mark that a couple of papers have shown. But at least within that kind of early post-operative um, uh, period, patients are feeling better and kind of moving a little bit quicker. Um, this is just kind of more uh, data kind of showing the MS, MIS at better reported patient uh, outcomes would compare to conservative open. And um, uh, infection rates were uh, lower in uh, quite a few um, papers. But you know, I've seen open surgical site infection uh, rates anywhere from two to six. Uh, actually, one paper recorded 10%, uh, which is extremely high, but um, the NIS overall rates were significantly lower. This specific paper included uh, elective surgery, so that 0.22% is, is probably uh, artificially a bit low, but overall they did show, uh, you know, it, it continued to be lower uh, compared to its, its open um, counterpart. So indications, like I, I kind of talked about earlier, there's no real... Um, no real hard indications for using MIS surgery. Uh, it's really just going back to um, basic principles, do they need surgery or not? So the MIS is more a surgeon's uh, comfort level. So the same considerations as bony and ligamentous injury patterns, the presence of neurologic injury, comorbidities, 
Uh, and then, you know, how comfortable is that surgeon with these specific techniques? Um, and basic indications still apply. So, um, you know, with the advancement of, of newer techniques, um, newer hardware, um, newer arthrodesis um, strategies, it can really be successfully used in um, a lot of unstable fractures with or without spinal cord injury, flexion, extension, distraction injuries, as well as unstable sacral fractures. So, it's just kind of a, a certain preference on how they want to do it uh, and if they think they need to use MIS for any sort of damage control principles. I would say there's really no hard indications, but there are hard contraindications, and that one being that you are not able to visualize what you need to radiographically. So um, a lot of MIS surgery is based on landmarks um, from the fluoroscopy. So if one is unable to see what they need to see, that it's a pretty hard indication that this is probably an unsafe procedure and, and should go to more traditional approaches. Um, kind of in just doing my literature review, um, you know, there a fair amount came up about do I need a fuse or, or not fuse depending on the, the injury pattern. So I just wanted to include a couple of um, papers. This was, um, you know, Kim et al. did a retrospective analysis of posterior fixation without fusion in uh, specific with oral lumbar fractures. They used uh, 23 patients under the age of 40, and they were all managed with transpedicular screw fixation without fusion in this percutaneous uh, format. The implants were all removed at 9.7 months on average, and the patients were observed for about a year and a half afterwards. That it did show that uh, fracture heights were maintained, um, and they had good functional outcomes. Um, specifically, fixation and regained motion of fixed segments, which was made this a good option for young active folks who want to to want to keep some motion, uh, and and they had good functional outcomes without the need for arthrodesis. Um, and then this next paper uh, by Denise also showed kind of arthritis did not improve clinical outcomes and it was associated with an increased surgical time, higher bleeding, and uh, did not significantly improve radiologic parameters postoperatively. Um, kind of more into indications and, and complications of surgery. So surgeon comfort, as I've discussed, um, and, um, you know, just experience with the techniques can be a big factor. This was a systematic review that showed a significant reduction in complication rate after a surgeon had performed 30 or more um, chronological MIS cases. And um, the inexperience, as one would expect, in, in MIS techniques was shown to lead to longer operative times and significantly increased radiation exposure. So it's all about the learning curve, as in any procedure. Um, as you'd expect, the more you do it, the more comfortable you are and the more effective you are. Um, Getting back into contraindications, so failure to achieve radiographic visualization is a, is a, is a pretty hard contraindication. And this specific uh, study showed an evaluation of pedicle screw position with MIS. Uh, they found 9.7% of pedicle screws were malpositioned. Um, but about three quarters of those, uh, after looking back you know, on, on uh, intraoperative imaging and op reports, uh, about three quarters of those had poor visualization. Um, usually in that L3 to 5 area where it's, you know, poor visualization due to uh, maybe some interference or from, you know, um, uh, adjacent bony um, landmarks that were kind of just blocking the, uh, the view. The um, radiation doses for the MIS can reportedly be up to 10 times higher than traditional open approaches. This gets back to um, the less experienced. Um, so if, if, you, if you can say it kind of all on average is 10 times higher radiation exposure, the, the less experience you have, the more radiation exposure you, you are uh, kind of proven to, to kind of give to that patient just because you're a little less comfortable, so more images are usually taken. Um, and then kind of I'll brush on some techniques. I know I'm talking to um, a, a room full of uh, you know, spine surgeons, so I'm the least versed in, in techniques, but I'll just kind of brush on some, some major uh, ones. Um, probably most commonly used uh, in the non-trauma and trauma settings. So the perk pedicle screws are, um, there's you know, many companies out there uh, creating uh, great technology and, and making it easier and easier as, as we come along. But um, these are some just four techniques. Mainly the top two are the ones that are kind of, I'd say, probably more mainstream use. So the true AP targeting, this is a picture on the right kind of uh, indicating that, and I would, I would probably wager that most folks listening are, are doing this. Um, it's just a, uh, a way to kind of uh, 
place screws percutaneously, but again, you need a uh, good visualization. You need to be able to line up the superior end plate. You need to be able to visualize the pedicle shadows. And so um, whatever, um, whatever company you're using is going to be the similar principles. You have to really um, have it lined up uh, based on fluoroscopic landmarks and using a James Sheedy on the lateral board of the pedicle wall and the trajectory is checked on the lateral. And so it is, um, you know, using fluoroscopy and landmarks to be able to um, minimally invasively uh, place pedicle screws. And then the rods can be advanced afterwards uh, once the, all the pedicle screws are in. This owl's eye technique, the second one down, is similar. Um, it, you just have to kind of you do a bit of an oblique view on uh, the fluoroscopy. Uh, disadvantage of that is you can't actually do two at a time. So a lot of times uh, part of this percutaneous approach is you can have two surgeons working at the same time to decrease your operative time. Um, and so you can't really do that on the owl's eye technique. But um, Park et al., they kind of showed a, um, a retrospective. Uh, retrospectively, they had, the true AP technique was shown to have a less than 2.9% uh, symptomatic breach rate of the pedicle screws, which is, um, which is good. And so they were kind of just proving that uh, the, the safety of the procedure, um, and again, these continue to get better and better with um, advancing technology. The, um, this is just a, a quick kind of case that was re was from one of the uh, the papers that um, I was using at Systematic Reviews. This is just a 52 year old male, uh, sustained a 30 foot fall and presented neuro intact with, this, with severe uh, thoracolumbar pain, showed to have an L4 burst fracture. And then L2 through 4 spinous process fractures, and these are just some cuts, sagittal and axial from uh, the um, CT. Um, they ended up being able to use just a percutaneous uh, approach, uh, minimally invasive, using uh, percutaneous fixation, kind of bridging that burst fracture from L3 to L5, uh, able to get an indirect decompression. The patient did very well, and there was no neurologic deterioration from the patient. And this is on the right, just images of them standing at the uh, uh, five months post-op, so we were able to really maintain the height and um, and uh, positioning. Um, kind of as we get newer, so there's newer approaches laterally. Um, this is just an alternative to traditional transthoracic and those retroperitoneal approaches, eliminating the need for a second uh, access surgeon, um, especially in the trauma setting. You know, if um, having a second surgeon may or may not be as easy, depending on where you are. So this just kind of allows one to really just take it upon themselves to be able to get to where they need to go using these lateral approaches. This can be used when uh, you need to get a better anterior decompression, you need to restore that sagittal alignment, and um, you can uh, use this uh, with, with fusion techniques. So the anterior column can be achieved with expandable you know, titanium cages. Um, you can use anterior lateral fixation, you can use uh, in conjunction with pedicle screw fixation, as in any lateral techniques, there's always complications, mainly going through that so as muscle. So, you know, thigh numbness, pain, weakness, um, really no difference um, when using these techniques and when we do this in an elective fashion. Um, this is kind of showing, this was a, a prospective registry data from uh, Spine in 2010. This was just kind of just talking about um, the specific technique. So they had 52 patients that were treated with four thoracolumbar fractures with uh, mini open lateral approach for corpectomy. Um, this uh, picture on the left is kind of showing the, the hardware they use, kind of a bit of a cartoon showing what um, uh, instrumentation they need uh, with the approach and kind of be able to get to uh, the area via lateral, be able to decompress, prep the discs, and then um, the uh, middle picture is kind of showing that expandable cage um, that they uh, they were using. They did use supplemental internal fixation in, in all patients. About three quarters were used uh, with anterior lateral plating, almost half transpedicular fixation, and, and obviously there was some combination of the of the both with there was being overlap. Um, the big thing that they got out of this uh, technique article or, or prospective registry data was that no patient experienced neurologic deterioration using this um, this technique, and so they had um, good outcomes. The picture on the right, obviously, is showing some subsidence. Um, they had two patients out of the 52 that uh, under that kind of on uh, post-operative imaging was showing some subsidence of these uh, these cages, so they actually did have to go back for um, revision. But 
um, overall, they were very happy, obviously, with the results. Um, and so this was kind of a demonstrating the safety of these new, uh, newer laterally uh, based minimally invasive techniques. And then kind of lastly, commonly in thoracolumbar spine, this is more in our lower energy, um, older um, fragility fractures. Uh, similar to our percutaneous techniques uh, for pedicle uh, fixation, we can use percutaneous vertebral segment augmentation techniques, um, balloon kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty uh, for cement augmentation of these fragility fractures. And this allows us to very, very minimally invasive um, minimally invasively uh, help with these fragility fractures as pain control can be quite uh, quite a big issue, um, especially if there are multiple levels. Uh, so this is just another tool in, in the toolbox to be able to minimally invasively um, address these fragility fractures. Um, so uh, kind of brush the surface on this, I know, um, probably could talk for hours and, and hours as uh, indicated by the amount of literature I was able to kind of just drudge up pretty quickly. Um, so MIS techniques are being widely used in the thoracolumbar trauma uh, setting, and they continue to involve um, the techniques can decrease morbidity, involve with traditional approaches, especially in the polytraumatized patient that one would like to consider damage control techniques. Um, and then, um, you know, back to they should be reserved for surgeons that are comfortable with the techniques, but I think in this day and age, most surgeons are being at least um, uh, trained in uh, one or two of these techniques. Um, and then the, the biggest thing I think to get out of this is the contraindications, and that is you must have adequate imaging for the procedure. Um, yeah, that's all, that's all I have. These are my um, citations. Any questions or um, comments? Great talk, Sean. The, appreciate you putting the time and effort into it. It's kind of a a little bit different topic, but I thought the fellows would also very much appreciate um, this. You know, like the literature in this topic really has gotten a lot more robust over the last five to ten years um, versus when I was going through training, it was still kind of pretty sparse. So mm -hmm. I think it's uh, I think the trauma world for sure is where a lot of us that are trying to promote minimally invasive surgery, the trauma world is where I think a lot of people have seen um its application be of really big benefit to um, our patients um and i think you're showing that here as well you know so this this is a good a good uh, uh a very good application for it and a very good way to you know apply that so everyone did you, on this call go ahead uh, did you see anything in the literature or what were the attendings' opinions on needing to take out the hardware if you're not doing a fusion, if you're just doing a fixation, and like the timing of that or the indications too? Yeah, there was, there was a couple papers. Um, one, both the papers that I was kind of really delving into, they both took the hardware out, but it was kind of trying to figure out, uh, I think, one if they needed to. Um, and if the, you know, if the construct would hold up and there was one specific one that where they all, they took them out at, you know, around the nine to 10 month mark after the, um, initial procedure. And, and, um, it was just part of the plan. They told the patient from the beginning, they'd be taking the hardware out and if they showed good, uh, they were able to kind of, um, maintain sagittal alignment and height, uh, and it actually regained, um, some mobility in these younger, more active patients. I don't, I don't know why you would hypothesize that you should keep fixation if you don't arthrodes. It seems silly. That, that never works. Over time, it may work in the in the trauma literature follow up, which is usually six months at best. Mm -hmm. But no no other place in the body does putting fixation across mobile joints work long term. Right. Agreed. So I think you have to plan to do that and if you don't you're just kidding yourself <laughs> but i think it's interesting i like the concept of uh, provisional stabilization and bony healing if if the underlying ligamentous structures are capable um, uh, that's a probably a tremendous advent for function if you can avoid long fusions in those cases so i did see a patient back and follow I totally anecdotal, but it's like two or three years after their fixation. And I just did it percutaneous without fusion. 
And I told him we'd like to take it out usually within the first year and we didn't. Um, but when he came back, uh, we got a new CT and uh, he had totally fused his ligaments, um, uh, which I thought was really interesting. So the screws were not loose. Yeah, and somehow his body, I guess, with the trauma and the disruption that he had, mm -hmm. actually ended up arthroducing it. Um, so I thought that was actually uh, fairly interesting to see. Um, but I would, in general, totally agree with you. And then the second point is hardware is what we get at Home Depot, not fixation or implants is what we use in spine surgery. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just trying to scream. You were chopping at, <laughs> at the bed, weren't you? <laughs> I beat you to it. Greg, you can't steal Dr. A's thunder like that. No, well, I to know that the legacy will continue. Like we all, we all know. I, I'm, I'm so happy. <laughs> so one of one, <laughs> I think it was a great talk. And one, one thing I, I just wanted to emphasize is, is it's trying to compare the minimally invasive surgery. Uh, is really have to uh, pay attention to details of each technique because uh, the definition of MIS is different in different uh, papers that you 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 you, you read. Uh, most of them, you know, similar techniques are the same, but be sure that you're comparing the apples with apples. So um, I think as long as the goal is there uh, of you know, you have to have neurologic recovery or not worsening. You know, you have to get the stability, either with fusion and non-fusion, and uh, and and hope for the you know maximal you know spinal motion and and uh, less complications. Those are the principles. And if you can do that with the minimal invasive, then that's great. But always keep those goals in in in, in mind and and look at the papers to make sure that they're all talking about the same thing. That was a great talk. Thank you. <clears throat> all right. Well, with that, guys, have an awesome Monday, and we'll see many of you around the hallways. Um, if not, have a great week. And um, thanks again, Sean, for, uh, for presenting this morning. Of course. Thank you.